Happy spring and welcome community to another segment of Educational Thursdays. Yes, you, as you can see, John Henry is not here, but you have myself, Colise Hollins with both sides of the conversation, and we'll be bringing up our youth team members, Sanai on, and she'll be reading the events. But nonetheless, this weather is gorgeous. We'll be getting into the 80s, and it's going to be a very nice weekend. So just get ready, prepare for it. But let me tell you, if you have not already subscribed Followed us, comment. We have Twitter, Instagram. Go ahead, subscribe. And also, we have a newsletter. Both sides of the conversation is doing things out here. We're really changing the narrative. So let me explain if you do not know. The mission of both sides of the conversation is to analyze the needs of the black and brown community, criticize any barriers that impact the advancement of the community, and then mobilize to support the community in overwhelming, excuse me, overcoming these barriers. We do this through open dialogue and community outreach. We are about the action community. We believe in blessing the people, all about that action. So that's why John Henry's not here, all about that action. We are doing things constantly in the community and there's always something happening, right? We have community events. There's a lot of things going out. So there's no need to stay at home. Relax, get your family out there. Enjoy your family. Um, so the weather's getting good. Allergy season is in. We have people with the sniffles. We have pollen in the air. So make sure you take care of yourself. Check on your loved ones. There's always something going on. And I'm going to go ahead on and bring up my youth team member, Sanaya. She'll be going over events shortly. But before we do that, I'll be reading the world news. But I wanted to bring Sanaya on to say hello to the community. Uh, hi, community. <laughs> um, yeah. Hi. Hi. So welcome, Sanaya. Thank you for coming on. And we're going to go ahead and get into our world news. And boy, do we have a treat for you later. This Educational Thursday, we have a lot to say, and you're going to find out what this treat is. First off with the world news, Oakland A's signed an agreement to purchase land for Las Vegas Ballpark. Oh boy, do we know where this is going? We know what happened with the Raiders, right? Major League Baseball, Oakland Athletics on Wednesday announced they have assigned a binding agreement to purchase land for a future ballpark, guess where? Las Vegas. Las Vegas. This is the disappointing. The mayor was not happy about this. So we know where this is going. Not only did they take the Raiders, NFL, now they're going to go ahead and take the Major League Baseball team. So Oakland's going to Vegas, y'all. Get ready. There's a death spiral. Here's what is at stake for Bay Area public transit. Listen to this. We need Funding, we need funding. Local legislators sent out a call to action ahead of a plant rally outside of the San Francisco City Hall Tuesday afternoon. There, they will urge the California government to provide desperately needed funds to keep Bay Area transit agencies afloat. So the buses, there's a problem. There's no funding. It's overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly low-income folks in the Bay Area, in San Francisco, essential workers, people of color who rely on public transportation every day. This is what Supervisor Dean Preston said. It is so important. I mean, public transit, we need that. We really need that. And it, it could be a bad adverse effect for us people. People talk about the dreaded transit death spiral. Yes, it is a very serious spiral. Ever since COVID, they haven't been able to regroup. It plummeted. The use of public transportation plummeted because COVID, you got to understand, COVID was out there. Folks didn't want to be around people. COVID spread and we knew, we know what was going on. We stayed in our houses. People were sick. There was not public transportation being utilized. So it plummeted. That death spiral could include things like no weekend BART, only hourly weekday services and even the possibility of entire muni bus lines being cut. This is what State Senator Scott Weiner said. So please, community, you hear what's going on there. Our public transit is being discussed right now at a very high level. It could impact us seriously. We need funding. So stay tuned and keep your ears to the ground on that one. Starship explodes. Giant SpaceX Rocket fails minutes after launching from Texas, yes. So Elon Musk, he launched the SpaceX rocket and it failed. Yes, right outside of Texas, there was a 
giant new rocket that exploded minutes after blasting off on its first test flight Thursday. It actually crashed in the Gulf of Mexico. So he was aiming to send his nearly 400 foot, that's 120 meters, Starship rocket on a round the world trip from the southern tip of Texas near the Mexican border. Well, there was no people, so thank God, and there were no satellites, so everything is okay, but it did crash. It didn't go too far. So listen to this. This is a good one. Teen celebrates 18th birthday as new millionaire after grandma gives him a $1 million winning scratcher. Ha! Hang's grandmother purchased the winning $1 million perfect gift scratcher at an Oasis market in Turlock. So they were on their way on a trip. Him and his mom, Hang, I'm talking about. And his grandmother had given him a, a, a scratcher for his 18th birthday. He scratched a ticket. He didn't even have ID. They turned that car around because they were going fishing. They turned that car around, went back home to get the ID so that they could claim it. He know he had that hot ticket. But boy, what a way to celebrate your 18th birthday. A million dollar scratcher. I tell you. I tell you. I don't know how he's going to spend it. He did share that he was going to invest in his future. But I tell you that. That is something. That is something. Mass shooting during teen's birthday party. We know about it in Alabama. It left four people dead, multiple injured. It was awful. It was awful. It was a 16-year-old's birthday party. I mean, they had star athletes. It's all unfortunate. And it's a shame. It's a shame, community, that you can't even have a birthday party and be at peace and, and, and celebrating someone's birthday. And then look what happens. Just awful. So trust me, we got to pray, pray, pray. Well, lastly, Warrior fans supportive of E40 at Monday's game, the watch party. So this is what happened. I don't know if you all know what happened with E40. He alleges racial bias that led to the ejection from the Kings and Warriors game. So this happened a few days ago. So this game, too, has a watch party. They want to see E40 there. There's no reason why E40 should not be there, right? Because we know who E40 is. He, he, he's one of the icons from the Bay Area. So we love E40. They support him. They want him to come. They totally disagree with him being ejected from the game. But I tell you, this game has been hot. It's been a hot topic. So now what we're going to do is go ahead and take you right into our events. Sanaya, take it away. All right, community, here are some of the upcoming events. So are, are you behind or having trouble paying rent? The San Francisco is having an emergency rental assistance program. There's tenant counselors. You can get more information at this link below. And also, if you have eviction papers, you can get more information at this link below. You can apply for assistance at this website down below. As I was having an emergency, community, emergency preparedness community fair, learn to protect yourself during a disaster. This is happening April 22nd, 11 a.m. through 3 p.m. at the SF Main Library at 100 Larkin Street. You can get more information at the link down below. Bay Area Girls Teen Summit Workshops. There will be prizes. It's free and all meals are provided. This will be April 29th, 8 a.m. through 7 p.m. at the Williams Chapel Baptist Church, 1410 10th Avenue in Oakland. You can register at the link down below. Both sides of the conversation and the YMCA are hosting a skate party. There'll be skate rental, food, raffles, and transportation. If this is happening May 6, 6.30 p.m. through 9.30 p.m. at the Golden State, 2701 Hopper Drive, San Ramon, you can register at Eventbrite. Pia's Dance Studio presents Dancing with the Ancestors. May 6 at 6 p.m. is the VIP Theater at 2029 East Harding Way, Stockton. It's $20 for admission. You can get more information at the link down below. Shogun Cafe 22 is having a Mother's Day gospel brunch and fashion show. The theme is Forever Valentine. It's featuring Pat Wilder and Spiritual Delight. This is happening May 7th, 2 p.m. through 5 p.m. It's free at the Powerhouse 2301 San Jose Avenue in San Francisco. Black Female Project is hosting an eight weeks of self-discovery program with Dr. Walters. Every Wednesday, April 12th through May 31st, this is happening at 5.30 p.m. through 7.30 p.m. It's free, and you can get more information at the link down below. San Francisco Juneteenth is happening, so you, can, you should save the dates, community. The June 10th Parade, the June 16th City Hall Kickoff and Gala, June 17th Fillmore Festival, and the June 18th is the Bayview Festival. You can get more information at the link down below. Magic Zone is having a 2023 summer program, June 12th to August 4th at 8 a.m. through 5.30 p.m. 
at 1050 McAllister Street. You can get more information at the link down below. You first slash OMI Family Day. There will be a bounce house, a 360 machine, bull riding, food, raffles, a bookmobile, and a sugar bear's appearance. This is happening July 7th at 12 p.m. through 5.30 p.m. at Merced Heights Playground, 801 Shield Street, San Francisco. City, city, city Kids is having a creator con. Save the date. Free creative outlets, art, music, and fashion. This is happening July 14th, 11 a.m. through 12.30 p.m. This is at 200 block of Jones Street. There's more information incoming. Youth, I mean, Youth First and Invest Black Community in Awards Show. This is happening August 11th at 7 p.m. Doors open at 6 p.m. It's at Brotherhood Masonic Center, 855 Brotherhood Way, San Francisco. $50 in food included in that price. You can register at eventbrite.com. Here are some ongoing events. So SFHRC is having a regular bi-monthly commission meeting. It's happening every second and fourth Thursday at 5 p.m. SFC Hall Room 416, or you can join the Zoom. African American Reparations is Advisory Committee is having monthly meetings virtually at 5.30 p.m. It's happening every second Monday. You can register at the link down below. Remove Reverend Amos Brown from the NAACP Reparations Task Force. Reverend Brown does not represent the change we need. Both sides of the conversation need your support and signature. Uh, scholarships and jobs. So there's the SF Adult Probation is recruiting for a key reentry division positions. Reentry division director and a senior community development specialist. You can apply at the link down below. And you can join our youth team. There's SF youth volunteers are needed. There's a paid stipend. You have to be a high school or college honor roll student. You can join us at the, at the link down below. And give back to the community. We need volunteers. We're the director of HR finance, IT and development, fundraising coordinator, event planner, and production assistant in marketing. If you're interested in any of these positions, you can email the email down below. Our work is inspiring and it feels good community. So we would love for you to volunteer. You make a difference in the community with tangible results to show it. We're a highly driven group of high impact because the right things done the right way. Not only will you contribute to the community, but you'll also learn a lot and gain knowledge in your field of interest within the organization. We value your ideas and input. Sign up to be a volunteer today and you can make a difference. Also, you can go to all of our social media sites for more news on how to give back to your community and support our organization. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Sanai, with all those events. Community, there is a lot that we have going on. So make sure, make sure that you get out in the community. There's things to do. Spring is here. We have great weather. Take your family out there. You know, there's not necessarily always money have to be spent. But without further ado, I need to share with you what our educational topic is on today. How to advocate for your child in the public school system. I tell you, Dr. Sabrina Bree Moore is a founder and executive director. She has three L's, literacy, leadership, and elaboration. I tell you, these, this Oakland-based organization and what Dr. Bree has to bring to you today is very, very impactful. So you got to be prepared for this. Get your notebooks out, log in, take your notes, put your questions on YouTube because she's going to come with it, y'all. Be ready. Her time is very well. Um, encouraged with our community and she's bringing it to us. I'm going to go ahead and bring her up. Dr. Bree, you are here with us. Say hello to the community. Hello, community. How y'all doing tonight? Get your notebooks out though, for real. Like this is not, a, don't watch me like I'm television. This is interactive. So I want, I want some good questions at the end of this. All right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm turning this over to Dr. Bree because she got it going on and I know that she has something great for us because it is very important for us to advocate for our children in this public school system because we cannot leave our babies hanging. All right, Dr. Bree, take on. All right. I am going to share my screen. Can we all see that? Yep, yeah, I see it. Okay, good. So um, as you already heard, I'm the executive director and founder of Literacy, Leadership and Liberation, an Oakland-based organization that supports literacy outcomes one neighborhood at a time. We can end up in San Francisco with the right, with the right level of support. So today I was asked, or well, actually I think I asked, I can't remember, it's been a while, to um, talk to you all about how to advocate for our children, for your children in the public school system. And that is charter, district, it doesn't matter to me. I'm agnostic. I really, it's any school our kids are in. 
And so um, as has been said, I'm Dr. Sabrina Bree Moore. That is, oh, I want you to know the picture there with me screaming is my inside voice. That's how I look inside, even on my calmest days. So I'm always 110% where our kids are concerned. This is my crew, um, the women, black and brown women who work with me every day to ensure that the kids that we are serving are gaining literacy outcomes. We um, do this work in community for free to ensure that kids can read, period, point blank. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram, just Google three L's and we will come up and you can reach out to me. My name and my number is always on the website. If you have babies in this world who you're like, they're struggling to read. I don't have, I don't know the questions. I don't know what to ask. I don't know what to do. Please call me or email me. I, I got 9 million emails, but I promise to get to you. I promise you have my word. Um, I always start with this. I always start with one, I want to honor native land. And I also want to recognize our ancestors um, and how we came to this country. But I also want to name so we're all on the same page that I fully believe that we are either reproducing or interrupting racism, that you are not, you are not in some void of not doing that. Either you are always constantly in the act of, of interrupting racism or you are a reproducer of it. And so every policy and every institution, especially our schools and our communities in every single nation is either sustaining um, inequity or working towards equitable systems. And so when we talk about advocating for our students and advocating for ourselves in these school spaces, that is an act of interruption. It is us working to be pro-Black, pro-Brown, pro-anti-racist. It is the act that we can do to advocate for ourselves and for our young people. Today, we are going to do a few things. I'm, I mean, well, right, you're going to ask me questions at the end. But my number one goal always is to have a little fun. Um, we did a welcome want to make sure that um, you know who I am. We did that. There's going to be an equity frame. I always like to start with what's something that's connected to the world, connected to our topic. So I'll start with just um, doing a little frame around like imagining the story we want to tell. What do we want to be true for our babies? What do we want to be true in our communities? What do we want to be true in the schools in which we are sending our kids for multiple hours during the day to, to what do we want the story to be? And then we'll talk a little bit about leading from the inside out and what it means to zoom in and zoom out on the challenges that we face both as parents, family members, cousins, aunties, all the folks who send our students off to school with the hopes and dreams that they leave reading, literate in math, um, able to do all of the things that help them to be great citizens in this world. And then uh, I'm gonna talk briefly about what it means to make the invisible parts of a curriculum in our schools visible. What do we need to do as the parents and as the as the folks who are advocating for our young people in order to make things clearer and question the system and keep doing that thing of interruption. So I said I would start with an equity frame. There, I just pulled this off the internet today. What's What's in the news? What questions are being asked? What articles are being written? What I know to be true is all across this country, all across the world, people are talking about the fact that our babies aren't reading. That in some states, it's less than 10%. In our state, in California, 30% of our kids are reading at grade level. That means 70% of our babies are not reading at grade level. That means three in 10 of our kids can read. The other seven who are in that bundle of 10 are not reading, just so we're clear. So some of, something was in the news. Uh, people are talking about ending the reading wars. What's a reading war? That is, some people are saying, back when I was in school in the 80s, we had this thing called whole language. You read the book, you're supposed to be able to learn how to read by just opening the pages and turning the pages. And now there's this other part that's like, we actually need to teach our kids to read. We need to teach them with phonics, like what's a letter and what sound does that letter make? And phonemic awareness, can they hear and understand the sounds and, and put those sounds together and make words and those words become sentences and those sentences become paragraphs? And then can they read that and understand it and say it and, and tell us what it just said? Talking about chances, um, states were given chances to create better standardized tests. We all know about those big old tests that we take at the end of the year that your students are going to take right now. They are getting ready to, or they have already started taking this big, huge test that's gonna tell us what have they learned for the course of the year? Some states were given an opportunity to change those tests because we know that they aren't always testing the right things. But what we also know is we do need something to tell us where our babies are. So I'm pro assessment. I'm pro, I'm pro knowing what is true and what is not true and having that be transparent and to, out to community. 
people are talking about special education and how it is costing so much and what can we do to ensure that students aren't going into special education that don't actually need it. How many of our students have IEPs or in special education because they can't read and not because of something else? Book bans. All across this country, they're banning books that support black and brown folks from knowing their histories and knowing where they come from. So like that's something we all need to be up on. I say all this to say, this is what's in the news. What's in Oakland news? We just saw this article from Ashley McBride back in March about what's happening with the um, union negotiations. So the unions are saying we need to get more, more money to teachers. Fully agree with that. And so the Oakland teachers are like, well, we're going to strike. You don't want to give us the money. You don't want to give us the raise. You don't want to give us the time. We're going to have a strike. But the parents said, no, my baby needs to go to school. We already had COVID closures. We already had all these things. We are not interested in a disruption of schooling. There's another way to get that money. And it is not by canceling school. I say all that to say is as we read the headlines and we know what's happening in education, what does it mean for us? to be a part of the conversation, not just partake in what they're saying and what they're doing, but what do we need to do to be a part of the conversation? And how many times have we seen parents advocate for change from a direction from the district, from the, the, the charter organization, from anywhere, and change happen? That's the point of this conversation. How do we get a part of it? How do we become a part of the change that we want to see? That is the point connecting what's happening in the larger world with our particular learning today. I'm gonna to tell you that I've been a teacher in Oakland. I've been, well, let's start word from the beginning. I've been a student in Oakland because I went to Oakland schools. I was a teacher in Oakland. I became a principal in Oakland. I run a nonprofit in Oakland for our community. So I, I have many hats that I wear out here in these streets. And, it, and for me, the part, when we talk about advocating for our students, it is not just the responsibilities of the families, it's the responsibilities of everybody who, who's in our communities. And so what I want to give us some perspective on today is what does it mean for us to understand the context, understand all of the media, understand all the news and have it in our brains and use that to zoom in on our particular schools, use that to zoom in on our particular students, use it to zoom in on our own personal work around the ways in which we're interrupting racism and ensuring that our kids are, are winning. And so here, here I want to talk about this idea of what's your perspective? Are you too close to it and that you are only thinking about your one, your, your actual perspective and not thinking about the whole community? Or maybe you are only thinking about the whole community and not thinking about individual students in schools who are struggling. So we going to challenge you today to think about your side and think about everybody's side. Think about the whole community and think about the individual students and your perspective because you also went through these schools. So here are some telltale signs if you are too close. If you get overwhelmed by the details, well, she said that he didn't have this thing and, and then, so what would it mean for you to zoom out and think about the whole context and what matters most? If you take things personally for, and, and you're like, this, this, what this, you, you talking to me, this is about me. Then maybe what it means for you to zoom out would be to think about a larger purpose is being served and what is at stake for others. So if it's just about you. Can we think about the other three parents in this room or the other three parents who are, whose students are suffering the same way? Because when we talk about advocacy, we're talking about changing the game for ours and not just us. Yes, yours and you and ours. If you too zoomed in, maybe you are trading favors and hoping it will do, what, what will it do for you? Okay, so maybe you tell a teacher, well, if, if you, um, if he don't have to do the homework or she don't have to do the homework, I, um, I'll make sure that they ask school, like, who is that serving? But when, when we could be thinking about what is the big mission here? What do we want to be true? We want the baby to be in school so they can be learning. So partially it's like advocating for yourself for some small things or thinking about the big picture. What if you too zoom then? Are you too close to a situation? Maybe you're making exceptions or special deals based on particular circumstances. I, my child got in trouble. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix this for him. My child got in trouble. I'm going to fix this for him. My child got in trouble. I'm going to fix this for him. All those little bitty fixes, and they haven't learned the lesson that they need to in order to, right? So we're advocating for our children, but for to what end? What, what will the circumstances reoccur? Will it keep happening because we haven't put actual policies and made decisions about how do we actually want to change? What does it mean? What does trouble mean? 
How are we building policies in place? Maybe your son is not the, or your daughter is not the only one. Maybe it's 10 kids. So that means the school needs to come up with a culture plan to change the whole thing. Because if 10 kids are getting in trouble for the same thing, it's not really, it's not, it's not a, it's not a yo kid thing. It's a culture thing in the school. Those are questions we need to ask when we zoom out. Maybe you're jumping and jump, you jump on an, any good looking offer that pops up. Oh, oh, that this, this organization said that they would tutor my baby three times a week. Well, then I'm just going to have them doing that. I'm not even going to worry about y'all. So what he not going or he not like, yes, organizations do, do provide off opportunities and, and supports and all of that. But I wonder what it would mean for yes, do the tutoring, but also let's work on what's happening in schools because that's where they spend the majority of their days. Your family may be able to afford tutoring or you might have a free tutoring offering, but not every family does. So we need to be in schools advocating for our babies. Does this fit the goal, right? The questions we can be asking is if this fits the goal, is this aligned with my vision? What do I want to be true of my neighborhood school or the school that I'm sending my baby to? And if it doesn't, then we shouldn't keep, I mean, do what you need to do for your kids. <laughs> but like at the end of the day, what does it mean for all of our kids? And then lastly, if you might be too zoomed in, you might be thinking about treating every situation as it's unique. Well, this only happened this time or this only happened this time. But what would it mean to go to the principal or the teacher and say, how often is this happening with other kids? Not specifically, because as a principal, I cannot tell you about other people's children. But I can tell you about situations across the campus that are happening. And I need you, mom, to volunteer more. Or I need, oh, you got to go to work? Mom, while you at work, you think on, on your break, I could get you to um, steal some envelopes. Or what is something that we can do to support to change the system, right? To change the outcomes. Are there other similar situations that we can learn from so that we can change the culture of our spaces that our children are in six, eight hours a day? Now, maybe you too far out. Maybe you ain't where I'm, you know, you in the, you in the community, you at the church down the street. So you ignore when plans change or potentially taking you off course. You, you see that the kids no longer are getting off the bus at eight in the morning, but you haven't thought about maybe the bus system has changed. We just heard in the news that the transportation is, is going to go awry. That might mean some of our kids don't make it to school in the morning because they, they, they can't get on the bus. They got to go to three neighborhoods. They got to So does the change impact the vision and the goal? If the vision and the goal is for our kids to be successful, to be great citizens in this world, to be readers and writers and mathematicians, go to college or get a job, does what you see and what you're experiencing in your bubble or all across this sphere, are you reading these articles? Does it change what you want to be true? What do we want the narrative to be? I'm going to go a little faster. I'm going to put some of these up here and then I'm going to start because you get where I'm going. I want to drill down to the one where it says you always stay on major established paths. You're going to do you. This is for all of the folks who just you ain't got no kids in school, but you sure going to go out to lunch and talk about them real bad. These kids was in the street and they doing and they right. You worried about your road, your path. You follow the rules. I'm a good person. I'm great. What does it mean? For you, because this is advocacy for hours, right? To think about, are there side roads or quicker routes to outcomes? Maybe you have a, a background in something that will support a school. If you see kids are, are after school in the street, do you know how to teach basketball? Because why you don't pick up a couple of hours to do a basketball camp? Or why don't you, right? So like, are you a plumber? Are you a... Uh, um, are you a um, anything, a, a, a CPA? You can do a finance class. Like, where are you showing up for our babies? Because you can advocate with your own skill set to help ours. So I wanted to think about this zoom out. Sometimes we go to meetings in our schools and we see data. It looks like this. It says, this is this, I just got off a report today. It says, which OUSD elementary schools are best supporting their students in literacy? And you see those schools in blue, that's the top 10 schools. This is the winter I ready data. This is the test that the district is given so we know where kids are reading. And you see this and you zoomed out because you can see schools are doing great and black kids are reading. And this is what we, right? But what do you see this when you zoom in? Does this data tell us if there are more than three out of 10 students reading that grade level? No, I just told you across this nation and in this city, and the same is true of San Francisco, and the same is true of Stockton, if not worse, that three out of our 10 kids are reading at grade level, which means seven out of those 10 are not. 
that data looks great, but it's big picture. When we advocate for our kids, we want to look at the big picture and celebrate the wins, but we got to get narrow and say, what about the other seven? Does this data tell you that your child, your nephew, your niece is able to read and comprehend a text? No. It tells you that they took a test and that when they took that test, they had growth. That can mean they learned two more letters. They can, that can mean they learned two more words. That does not mean that they have, have mastered reading. So we have to get clear that when we're seeing data, we have to ask questions about it. What is it saying? Are we zooming in? Are we zooming out? If it's zoomed in and it's your individual child and your child is doing all right, can we ask in that meeting, well, how are the other black kids doing? Is there something I can do to support? Same thing here. This, this, this is data about our Latino students. Look at those scores. 52 test takers, 46% of them, almost half of them made one a year's growth in half a year. That is phenomenal. That's zoomed out, right? But when we zoom in, Latino students are the largest ethnicity subgroup in OUSD. They make up almost half of the students in our district. They also, the fact is that three of 10 Latino students are reading. So that's some good data. And then we need to zoom in and say, are they reading? So go to, go to these meetings at the beginning of the year. They're going to share all of the end of the year data. Kids, I just told you, students are taking the test right now. They're going to share the data. The lens might be zoomed out. And you got to say, well, what does it mean for the kids in our school? What does it mean for my baby? What does it mean for the class that my child will be in? Here's the questions we're asking. Here's what's true in OUSD. They just adopted a, a very coherent assessment system. This was in the report. The schools have transi transitioned to a more rigorous literacy curriculum. That means the kids are gonna be doing some really comprehensive work and reading. They're gonna be thinking more critically. This is in the report. This, I'm not making this up. This came from the report. The district has launched a three-year plan with improving early literacy as its first pillars. That means all of our students in kindergarten, first grade, and second grade, and third grade gonna get some strong reading instruction. That's phenomenal. The district staff regularly shares literacy progress to the school board and the public at large. They are sharing, they are transparent. There's some accountability. These are all great facts. That's zoomed out. Let's zoom in. If the school is transitioned to a more rigorous curriculum, can our kids actually, um, can they access it, right? Can they, can, if they're struggling with reading, if three out of 10 kids are reading, but the other seven are not, what are we doing to ensure that they can access this rigorous curriculum, this, this more challenging, more critical curriculum? Let's zoom in on that second bullet. The district launched a three-year plan for improving the early literacy, right? Improving elementary literacy as its first pillars. If we, we are saying that that plan addresses TK, K, first, second grade, second grade, third grade. Well, what happened to the fourth and fifth graders? We know that the current fourth graders were the kids who experienced the COVID closure in kindergarten, which means they missed those first years of in-person learning. Can we zoom in on that? The district has sharing their data. It says here school and the school board and the public at large. The public at large is all of us. When we zoom in, are you seeing this data shared about your school? If you're not on this list, where are you? So the question is, how are we leading from the inside out? When I say inside out, leadership is a muscle, right? And I'm, I'm a big girl. I, 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 you know, I walk a little bit, I walk a little bit, but I ain't got no muscles because I haven't been working out. Now I got some barbells over here, but don't judge me. But if I had, if I start to use those barbells every day and I'm pumping and I'm pumping, this right here, this little flag right here is going to turn to muscle and that muscle will make me stronger. What I'm asking us to do is to start to flex that muscle of zooming in and zooming out. Zoom in and zoom out. Ask the questions. If the if the if you're getting something that's big, how do you get lower? Big, little. Zoom in. You start with yourself as the farthest in. Then you zoom out to my student. How's my baby doing? How's my niece? How's my nephew? How is my right? And then we ask the question of our school. And if the data is about the whole district, zoom in to the next layer, which is the school, and then to your student, and then to yourself. Because you as a family, you as the person who is advocating for your babies, you also have things to learn and, 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 and things to address. Leadership is a muscle everyone has. And it only gets stronger with exercise and practice. 
Zooming in and zooming out only gets stronger with exercise and practice. We need to build and engage the leadership of many in order to meet the needs of those closest to the problem. Those are our babies. We only create cre effective solutions if we are building our muscle to do that. And we do that together. I just showed you this. Schools have transitioned to a new, more rigorous literacy curriculum. I'm with it. I helped them do that. I'm super proud of our district for making sure that we have a line curriculum. That means all the schools are doing the same thing. So kids get equitable access to learning. That word curriculum is a very different, a very word we throw around. But what it means is anything you're learning. If you are learning that you're smart, that's curriculum. If you are learning math, that's curriculum. If you are learning that you are not a reader because you can't read and you ain't never read, that's curriculum. It's anything that students are engaging with. So that thing said, curriculum. I asked the question, what are the curriculums that we have in schools? One, we have explicit curriculum. That is, this is the math book we're going to teach. You're going to learn that. That's I said it. I'm teaching it. That's explicit. That means I said it. It's straightforward. There's no gray to it. There's hidden curriculum. It's the unofficial curriculum. We teach it, but we don't say we're teaching it. And sometimes we don't even know we're teaching it. That's racism. If a kid comes to school and every day they see all the kids who don't look like them get treated differently, they are learning that something is wrong with them, that something is right. That's a hidden curriculum. It happens. That's how we internalize messages about ourselves because it's hidden. And then lastly, there's the absent curriculum. This is the curriculum that we never we we never get taught we know we're supposed to learn how to read but it didn't happen so it's absent they explicitly said we were going to get a thing but did it happen these are three types of curriculum i think when we say advocate for ourselves and advocate for our students and advocate for our schools we got to make the hidden curriculum visible we got to make the explicit explicit we got to make the hidden visible we got to make the absent present when we say that, I'm saying, what what, what was I planning to do and learn and now have I learned it? They said I would learn a thing, did I learn it? They said your kids would learn to read in kindergarten, did they learn to read in kindergarten? If they did not, advocacy. When I, when I say it's hidden, what have I learned and did not even realize I was learning? Your kids come home, there's something they, they're doing differently. They're sad. They may, right, they're getting, anything that they are learning that is hidden, that the school ain't putting in the handbook, they ain't sharing it at the assembly, saying, Yes, all of this, those kids got bullied and they are sad and it's hidden, but you see it because it's messages that your baby is receiving. It's messages that our kids are receiving. It's the education that is being taught without words. And then there's a hidden curriculum. What well, we know they're supposed to learn, but they haven't learned it. We are advocating for that. Here's, here's an example, explicit. You, you knew tonight you was coming here to both sides of the conversation how to advocate for your child. You knew what I was going to teach on. I'm teaching it. If, if it's explicit, I said it. What's hidden? What are the messages you received about your role in your student's education without being told with words? Some of us have heard this message. If you could stay in your lane, that would be great because we don't want you in the school. I, okay, mama, I hear you. Okay, mama. Okay, Tia. Okay, right? Like it's a message. I just need you to stay in your lane because I'm doing this. But my baby can't read, but my baby can't read, but my baby can't read. It's hidden. You hear it because of the actions, because the way people are responding to you, because of the way our kids are showing up, not reading. It's hidden, but we see it because it's obvious to us as their people. And then what's absent? Where's the thing? Where's the spaces in schools where parents are learning? Is that present? If not, advocate for it. I, if I feel like something is missing, I'm going to fight for it. If I feel like a hidden curriculum is happening to my baby, I'm going to fight against it. I'm going to be constantly interrupting systems of oppression, systems of racism, systems that keep our kids from thriving in this world. We have to make the invisible visible. And when they say explicitly they're going to do a thing, they better do a thing. Are we fighting for that thing? We have to make it visible in our schools, in our personal lives. What has the school told me my student will learn? What is the culture of the school teaching my student? What, are this, what does my student believe as a result of being in this building for how many hours a day? What are their behaviors? What are their words? What are the assumptions they're making about themselves as a result of being in this space? And if and when our kids are showing us that the hidden curriculum is harmful, we advocating against that. And what should students learn in school that they are not being taught? If your kid is in the second grade and they cannot read, 
They don't learn in the third grade. They learn that in kindergarten. It's absent curriculum. I'm going to the school. My baby going to learn to read. I want to know what intervention they're going to be in. I want to know what acceleration program they're going to be in. I want to know what's happening in the after school program. And I want to be able to sit in that classroom because it's not going to be absent much longer. I'm advocating. Explicitly for parents, for, for the folks who, who are our people, the families, the folks who are our kids' people. Right now, we know explicitly, or it might be a little different in some schools, that parents aren't inside the school because COVID happened and it shut down. Maybe I'm advocating for next year, I want everything open. I want to go walk my kindergarten to class. And maybe what's hidden is that there's a space, it's, it's a volunteer on Oakland F1 for you as a parent to sign up to be a volunteer. What that means is even if your school is closed, you can be in the school because you become a volunteer, you get your fingerprints done, and you could go all through the school and you can help kids and all through the school. And on your day off, if you want to go teach some reading and read with some babies, you can do that because it's hidden, but it's real. And then there's the, and what's absent in schools. Again, I want you to volunteer. <laughs> hint, hint, volunteer. Hint, hint. We need job. We need the. We need the folks. If you don't have no kids in schools, can you volunteer? Yes, volunteer. We need adults in the building, people with our babies who want to be in there. But we got to fingerprint you because safety first. But we like you. But we don't like everybody that much. So, zoom in and zoom out. I'm going to give with a very specific example. Suspensions. This happens. We hear when I, as a principal, parents will come and they say, um, why my baby getting suspended? Why is it just my child? This is this, this, this what I'm as a principal, because you don't want your baby suspended. And that is real talk. And guess what? We don't want to suspend your baby. We don't want to. And there's rules and stuff. Right. And then and then we get this question. What about the mother kids? Well, they, he was with or she was with or they was with. What about the mother kids? And on my mind is a principle where I'm thinking, I can't talk about other people's children. But that's the zoomed in version, right? That is, you're angry, I'm upset, your baby's upset, the kids have had a little quarrel. We can, we're gonna restore that. But what could you do? Well, how could you come to the school and advocate for suspension to not be the ways in which we handle disruption in our schools? We're gonna advocate for a different system. We start to pay attention to who's suspended. So 3.4% 3, 3 of students, this is last year's data for OUSD, 3.4% of students were suspended. That's 1,229 students were suspended of the 36,000 students in the district. So how do you find that data? So you could come to the school and say, I looked up the suspension data for our school. And what I don't, I want to ask you about the other kids who got spending with my baby. Okay, you can't tell me about nobody else's kids, but can you tell me what you are doing to change Suspension being the only recourse. Where is the restoration? Where is the opportunities for change? Where is the pouring into it? Right. I want y'all to Google. Now you're gonna be you're just gonna be recording on YouTube. Google OUSD data dashboard. Google what I just put on this slide. OUSD data dashboard. Because guess what? It's public, and it's public in San Francisco, and it's public in Stockton, and it's public in Tracy because districts have to publish the suspension, the attendance, the reading, the math. It's public. Just Google it, and Google is magical. It will find that data dashboard for you. For Oakland, you're going to click on public dashboards. Didn't I just say it was public? My God, it says it on the internet. It's public. After you click on that, I want you to click on, you're going to scroll down. This is all the dashboards in Oakland. They got assessment. They got grades through a three through five ELA. That's um, English language arts. They got math. They got all the things. But I'm going to have you click on suspended students because your baby got suspended and you want to know what's going on in my school around suspension because we're going to advocate for the changing of that system. Click suspended students. Then you're going to click on snapshot because I just want to see what's happening in my school. Once you click on sad snapshot. And, yeah, and once you get in there, you can start playing around. You get fancy with your data and bring it to the school, print it out, ready to share, share with the principal. I know the data. You're going to go to, it's going to see this. You're going to see this when you get to Snapshot. And after Snapshot, you're going to choose your school. See where I said select schools? Choose your school. And then you want to view by student group because y'all want to know what's happening for black kids. So I picked ethnicity because I want to see it broke down by race. And that is the whole district. Oh, my God. Why is black kids being suspended at such a higher rate than every other student group? This ain't made up. This is the data dashboard. 
That means 8.3% of black kids. Now the average for the district is 3.4. I just said 8.3% last year for black kids. I say that's some advocacy we need to be doing. Now you wanna know about your particular school where you say select schools, you drill down to your school, pick your school. We gotta stop just thinking about our circle, our personal, our student. We gotta start thinking about the school, the culture, the changes, the advocacy, the turning, what we know to be true into action. Where's the hidden curriculum? What are our babies learning that we don't want them to learn? And stop reading about it and be about it. Be about it. And then what do we want to be true for our district? And I know we work, I work. And if you can't take off, you tell that principal, I want you to get on Zoom with me. I'm gonna share my screen and show you I know how to get to the public dashboard. And I'm gonna show you my screen and show you that I see that this school in Texas is doing this thing because we watched, we watched the news last night, me and my baby, and we saw in Texas, they not doing suspension, they doing this. I wonder if we could do a small, we could try it. We have to turn what we know into action. And I'm gonna stop talking now, but when we talk about advocacy, we talk about it from a place of, not just yours, but ours. And not because you don't have, you have kids in schools, but because you care enough about our community to stand for our community. Be the change. Wow, very, 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 very powerful, Dr. Bree. I'll tell you, so there has been so much going on around all of this and, and you just brought something so powerful. It's like you set fire under all the parents. You set fire on and so I'm hoping that everyone listens to everything that you've shared. But one thing that I went through, because my son, my youngest son was one of those kids that used to tap, play with the pencil, busy, busy, brain just going. And so here I am getting called at the hospital, like, you need to come get your son. He's acting out. He's disruptive. Why is it that black and brown kids always get referred to IEP? It was not an IEP issue. My son was so far advanced, they had to have him tutor because they couldn't keep him going. So once we had him tutoring students, it was keeping his mind going. And so, because everything was born in school, but don't turn the IEPs just because our black and brown children are busy or, or as you call disruptive to the class. Mm -hmm. Share as to why this always happens. And see, you, 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 you named it. At the end of the day, it is, IEP is an individualized plan. It basically means I need to do something different for this baby. But that don't mean different means put me in a different classroom. Different might mean for our kids, as genius as they are, acceleration. Put me in, a, in the second grade, I'm in the first grade. Like, we got to get people to, that's the advocacy part. Is it, so when I, when you say IEP, are you saying that my baby hasn't learned the things that he don't know the things? Or are you saying that he learns differently enough to want to be in another classroom? There's two different things. So, so we have to force folks to do their jobs. And I, and we know the data is clear. More black students are referred to IEP for um, emotional disturb, to disturb, and, and that follows them for the rest of their lives. Like the, that don't come off your record. And that is your child go to school and they, you, you don't already taught them all the letters. So they in kindergarten and all the other kids are learning the letters and they're like, I know this already. So of course they over there playing at the kitchen. And now you want to tell me, call me, tell my baby playing at the kitchen because he know the letters. I taught the letters already. He knew them, right? Like, so why can't he go into another block or why can't, but that's the advocacy. And then you might go to class to visit your baby and you see three other black boys in the back of the room. Don't just stop with yours. Say, well, I'm in the classroom. I see three other black kids, but here's the thing. Sometimes we had a 10 with that conversation. What I'm saying is take it back to a two and say to the principal, I'm wondering if we could come up with another strategy for black boys, just because what I'm observing, because then they can hear you just as if it's just as angry as you are. They are trying to like solve the problem and all the things. But at the end of the day, we're talking about a culture change. We're talking about teachers seeing that black boys are so brilliant that they could be listening to the teacher and playing in the kitchen. I know because I've been a teacher and I teach right now, even with all my other jobs on Wednesdays, I teach a black boys group. They are brilliant and can do 10 things at once. Trust them. And then give them the test at the end of the week and see if they do it. But if you put them out of class, they can't learn the thing and play in the kitchen at the same time to show you that they learned the thing. Oh, boy, did you say that? Because I tell you, I used to be like in high school. Why is all that music on? Ain't you not ready? Ain't you have to get ready for a test? You have a test. I am studying for my test. I'm like, why are you listening to all this music? Exactly. <laughs> yes, we have a very creative 
way with Vernon. And I almost think it's like they don't take the time to understand our culture yeah. and how sharp we are. It's like automatic. We black or brown. We better get him out of here. He's going to blow. His mom and daddy going to come up here and they're going to blow. It's like, wait, 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 wait. So, yes, we do be on a 100. We need to break it down to a two and try to find out, really, how could we get to the bottom of it? And there are other children that's going through the same thing. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times um, grandparents are raising the grandchildren. How can an elderly person advocate for their child, their grandchildren? Because I was raised by my grandmother. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, yeah, I gave her a hard time. Nonetheless, <laughs> gave her a real hard time. But how can an elderly person advocate for their, their grandchildren? What's the most effective approach and what should the, the, the most impactful approach be? Because they're elderly. You know, the older folks, they don't, they're not just going to be causing all that chaos. They want to come in there and just hit it. How can an elderly person approach this situation? I would say just just my experience as a principal and when many times we had students whose whose grandparents were raising them is it if at the beginning of the year it, right or any whenever you cuz sometimes you get them in October or you get them in January it's to come to the principal or come to the the school team and say that this is the situation and like be honest form transparent relationships so that folks know what the actual reality is you ain't got to bury your bones i know we black people we say don't tell my business in the streets and we ain't I ain't trying to get you to tell all your business and you get to Kool-Aid and all that. But what happens is then the school can actually be a partner with you. And we can, we can, we, a lot of times we have experienced harm in schools as the parents, as the grandparents, as the, and so we don't trust the school. But the thing is that, that more and more folks are wanting to form different partnerships within, in community. And so the, the one form the partnership or, or, find out who in the school is a person you can who can have your back. And then the second thing I would say is is you can tell you tell a school what you need. You the school works for you. We 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 the teacher works for you, the principal works for you. That you don't work for them. And you don't owe them anything. Right? Like at the end of the day their job, our jobs as educators is to ensure our kids are winning. And if that is not the the case, there are recourses. It's called a level 1 complaint. That goes straight over their head out the school building to the downtown. And you ain't got to leave home to fill it out. You fill that thing out, you take it to the office, and you say, fax this in. And all, and that 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 that's another level of advocacy. And I'm not saying fill it out because your kid didn't get no waffles this morning. But I'm saying you, you've gone to the school, you've done what you needed to do to communicate a thing, and that don't happen. There are recourses for you. It don't stop at the school. Wonderful, wonderful. Yes. And, and, and your passion is, oh, above and beyond. And we really appreciate you for doing this. Can you share with us one of your most remarkable moments with the child that you've advocated for? Because I could just feel it. I, you've been there, done that. What is one of your most remarkable moments that you have changed in the area? So many, so many. Um, I, I would say my, 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 okay. I'm, I'm, I, I, Everybody, my favorite student, even for any of my kids who are watching. But um, I just had this one baby who, who um, I, so normally it's not a lot of black teachers, but when I was a principal, I hired mostly all black teachers. But in the school I was originally at, I was one of a few. And um, and so when you're a new teacher and you're black, they give you all the kids, right, that they think are so not great, right? And so that's them, my babies, all, especially like all the little black boys. I'm like, give me all, I take 40 kids. If it's, if they, you know, they rolling with me and they, they you know, what they, they with it, they with it, they get it, you know, and I taught fourth and sixth grade. And so one, one of my fourth grade students, he apparently had been suspended a million times before me. He fought all the time. He was so angry. And, um, and, um, so I was like, I'm going to your house. I'm going to your house. And I kept saying it a couple of days. I'm going to your house. And he was like, you ain't going to my house. Don't nobody come to my house. And da, 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 da. Boy, I tell you, I, I, um, it was raining one day. He had got on my last nerve. He, he went and took the tetherball pole out the thing and took it home. I, that last straw. So I go, I get to his house. I'm sitting out front. I see, I see him walk up. Cause I don't know which apartment. See him walk. I know the address, but I don't got the apartment. See him walk up. I follow him right up the stairs. He don't even know I'm behind him. He knock on the door and I'm right there. I say, hey, Miss Pam, how you doing? Um, You got a tetherball pole in here? Because I'm not missing a tetherball pole. And, and oh, you cooking? Can I eat? He know what to do. 
I'm sitting at the kitchen table with them. We is having dinner. And I tell you what, after that, he would advocate for me. Like kids would be doing things. He'd say, that's my teacher. You don't do that, right? Like it, that, that was it, right? He's like, somebody came to his house. Somebody did what they said they were going to do. For our babies, if you say something, do it, right? Don't, don't, don't be another person that tells them a lie. If you say you're going to teach me to read at the beginning of the year, I want to be reading at the end of the year, right? I want you like that level of advocacy for me, home visits, um, really showing up. If a student has an IEP, if the IEP says they learn a certain thing, I show them the IEP. That's what you're supposed to work on, but you're going to work on your grade levels. We're going to work on these things. You're going to master all that and we're going to get you out of that. And if how you learn is how you learn, I'm a, I'm a, you like, we have to create caring, loving spaces that are, are, are rigorous that, right? Hold our kids to the highest expectations. I'm the bar is here. You're going to meet this bar, but I'm going to show you how to meet this bar. And for me, it's, it's, it's the, it's that it's when parents, when a mom comes and she is at a 10, that that's the mom, right? That's that right there is that says to me, I love my baby so much that y'all hurt my heart. And so we, for me, those are the moments where I'm like, stop. I need to stop and hear what she's saying. I need to stop and pay attention. But when they don't do that, when you don't have a person who's going to stop and pay attention, I want you to, that's when I want you to say, who, what's my cousin who, who could be at a two, who could come say the thing I just said. So this girl can hear me because we need to make sure our kids get what they need and not. Right. And so like, I'm not telling you not be you, be you, but we need to get our kids what they need so they can read and, and be successful in this world. Oh wow, that that just gave me chills. That tetherball pole, because boy, we I had so I had to nice. beat this Maria. Oh, Maria was hard playing tetherball. I'm like, I'm gonna beat her one day. And I just kept playing. But I tell you, I remember those grades clearly, fourth through sixth grade. And my grandmother had the nerves enough to tell Miss Rhoda Martin, may she rest in peace, that she could whoop me. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, that was my teacher. I did like the boy did you. That's my teacher. Don't <laughs> don't mess with her because boy grandma just gave her permission that she could whoop me and that was long ago but yes. I felt like because she came to the house mm -hmm. and when she came to my grandmother's house where I live grandma told her you I give you permission to whoop her mm -hmm. and I'm like she came to the house because she cared mm -hmm. she cared and you know I love, I love that baby so much I love all my kids so much I walked the kid home one day I said you know what we just gonna go home we just See? gonna go home. <laughs> granny opened the door I said granny I had to walk him home. I had to tell all the other kids, go on off, go on off somewhere. I, I, he got to go home right now. And I, and then somebody watched my class and I walked him home. And then I walked him back to school after, you know, Granny had, had handled, do, did what she did. Do, you know, talk to him, whatever. See what I'm talking about? This is something else. I tell you, when we sit up there and stand up front for our kids and when those teachers show that sincere yeah. compassion, it, it does something to us. It makes us want to go to school with a whole different attitude because we don't know what our children's home life is. We right. don't. But when they get to school and they find out that somebody mm -hmm. is looking and caring, it is so important, so important to us. And mm -hmm. I, I had so many, so many experiences coming through school and, and being, you know, a minority and, and mm -hmm. you're not in the best area of the town. Yeah. It's like you're already looked down upon, you know, and it's not right. Instead of someone taking the time and not looking at us as being defensive and getting to know what it is that we need, I tell you, because when that math division, I had a teacher, she took the time because the division wasn't clicking. Mm -hmm. She took the time and showed me I took off. I'm talking about That's it. trigonometry, ge geometry, algebra. This stuff carried me all the way through college, but I needed someone to take the time. So it's just wonderful that that you have done so much, so much, so much to advocate for our children because without someone that's willing to be that voice, our children are nowhere. And, and it's unfortunate because they're our future. Yeah. So why wouldn't we want to speak? Right. Not just for ours. I heard you earlier. Not just yours, ours. Mm -hmm. You know, and so this has been a very great impact, very great very great um the the actual presentation that you brought is shared so much so much so i, I just want to i want to know one more thing dr brie can you share something with the community before 
we get ready to, to call it our evening because you've brought a lot of information. And I've seen that someone has shared about how Sanger, the transportation stopped in certain areas and they, they stopped the children. And the, because the parents had to go to work, they couldn't take their kids. It's like there's a lot of budget cuts. It's all about finances, you know, but our babies, it's about our babies. And, and we have to show up and be present. But last but not least, if you can just share with the community, wrap up any shout outs that you need to give, please do so. Yeah, I, I, I will say I want to shout out to to one educators and um who do show up, right? Who, who really do care about our kids and really, I don't care what skin color you have. If you are caring about our kids, if you are down with the home business and down with the actually slowing down to ensure that they have it. I definitely want to shout out. Um, I, I shared in the deck that OUSD has has adopted a curriculum for K, TK to third grade to ensure our kids are reading. And that, to me, if we could get every district, if your district has not adopted a curriculum that ensures that every kid is learning to read, advocate for it. Um, I want to give a shout out to um, 3Ls, my 3Ls team, Literacy, Leadership, and Liberation in the town. We are um, having our big event this Saturday extravaganza. If you are in anywhere near Sabrani Park and you want to come out, go on our website. We have information about that. We're going to have jumpers and hot dogs and the whole get down. We're going we gonna to party up. We got our first group of um, young readers who are graduating from the program because they are at grade level. And they have worked so hard to get there. Um, and so we just, yeah, shout out to my 3Ls team and, and shout out to you all, right? I mean, this the idea that there's a space for us to be learning and to be growing together and to be forming partnerships and coalitions to do the right work to be to be to be listening and learning about education and not from a place of politics but from a place of advocacy um and 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 to build our communities right like what what we know to be true is when black kids were learning from black teachers they were reading and so more and more i'm not saying that it needs to be black teachers and black i i got do fully agree with that though but I'm, what I'm saying is that we know what black teachers were doing. They were holding high expectations. They were holding our kids accountable. They were they were not lowering the bar, believing our kids can't. They when they, when our kids didn't, they will go tell, go tell. So that part. How come I can't hear you, sis? I say yes, absolutely, very powerful. Yes, you're right. They would actually come to your grandmother's house and go tell. So it's like, yes, you, you better understand what, what your mission is. And boy, I, you have brought so much enlightenment, how you've done everything for the community. So it's like, as Bree said, community, please understand. Bree, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please understand. Bree has advocated from being a teacher or principal. She has her own and she has a passion that you cannot deny for mm -hmm. our children. Three L's, the Academy. I tell you, this has been great. This weekend, you have something going on. Please give us that information. And you know, community, there's one thing I want to share. It's always been said, am I, am I my brother's keeper? Yes, you your brother's keeper. You are. Yes. Absolutely, you are. Our youth is our future. Yes. And as Bree was sharing, we need to volunteer. When you go to the school, yeah, make sure you're in good graces with the law and you can get fingerprinted. But we need to to volunteer see what the the teachers are sharing with our students especially when they're minorities we want to know we mm -hmm. want to know what is being shared with our children what are they learning yeah. what is your presentation style are you overlooking anyone what are you bringing what are the kids coming home talking about have that discussion that conversation with your baby what did you learn today talk to me about it volunteer get in there yourself show that you mean your child some good in others when they see a parent come in, I guarantee you, parent, grandparent, whoever you are, when yes. they see one come in, they go go home and talk about it. So-and-so's mama came in, so-and-so's daddy came. Volunteer, volunteer, mm -hmm. get in there. You have to show up. And as she shared, Dr. Bree shared explicit. What is going on? Hidden. There's three curriculums, not just only explicit and hidden, but absent. We have to advocate for our children. Mm -hmm. Zoom in, zoom out. You've shared all of this with us. And, and there's something else because you got to get in there to know what's going on. You can't just be mute. You have to speak up. You have to say something. And as she shared, Bree shared with us community that you have to tell them what you want. This is taxpayers' dollars that's going for this funding. Trust me, they are working for us. I'm not saying that you don't have your part because we still have to uphold mm -hmm. our children. 
educate and help them with their homework. Make sure that things are turned in. Right. We have parent teacher conferences. I go. I don't see many parents. It's like if you got our 300 something students, where's all the parents? The whole school should be flooded. Where's everyone at? Don't be absent minded about your children. They are the future. And you know, you have to understand, don't come in there with that attitude. You know, you can't say nothing to my child because my mom was like that. You know, even though I live with my grandma, she would come in there. <laughs> but I tell you, community, be there for your children. If they get to the bottom of it, if yeah. someone is complaining on your child or has a, a, something negative to say, get to the bottom of it. Ask open-ended questions. Get the teacher and sit down with your child. Find out what is going on because you need your child to learn. You need no disruption during the classroom. You need right. your child to learn so that they can go through school. You don't want your child to be passed along. You don't want them to be a headache to their teacher. You want them to be able to absorb all the essential material that they have, you know, and as Dr. Bree was sharing, what is going on? What's troubling them? Right. Is it the policy? Is there a culture plan in place? We need to find out, be there for our children in the public school system. You have to advocate for them. Don't be sleep on it, community. Please right. don't be sleep on it because this has been a great, great outstanding presentation. I'll tell you, Dr. Bree, it has been lovely. Community, Sunday conversation, this Sunday, social issues affecting black boys and men. Yeah. This is going to be deep. It's going to be deep. So please, community, Sunday, we are having our show. We're going to have this conversation. Dr. Bree, we thank you so much for bringing this presentation to us. We adore you. And thank you again. Have a great night, community. Stay safe. Stay cool this weekend. It's going to be in the 80s. Also, get out in our community events. If you haven't liked, subscribe, followed us, subscribe to our newsletter. We'll let you know. We give our shows on Tuesdays, Hidden Gems. We have our Educational Thursdays, as you've seen, how to advocate for your child in the public school system. That was today's Educational Thursday. So please be alert when you subscribe. You ring that bell on YouTube. It'll let you know that we're about to go live. But I tell you, community, thank you for spending your Educational Thursday with us this evening. And we look forward to seeing you on Sunday. Have a good night. Good night, all.